you know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Welcome to the Chasing Giants podcast brought to you by Osseo Gear with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Don, we kind of teed it up last week that I would be sitting in Chicago uh, for this episode, but after we started talking, we're doing it late tonight, right before I leave to go north. Uh, It was just going to be easier to do it here than uh, in a hotel, hoping that I had good enough cell service. Uh, we're, We're doing this to air on September 11th. Uh, and first of all, uh, before we do that, September 11th is always going to be a uh, kind of a heartfelt, um, humble, surreal, I don't know what other words to describe it, day that I think a lot of our country has lost focus in what really happened that day. And uh, I hope people uh, teach their children what the true meaning of today is and uh, put things in perspective a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I, I know I remember exactly where I was at whenever I heard uh, about those planes crashing into uh, the, the different buildings there in New York and Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, I just can't believe that, you know, how far this country has fallen, if you will, since that day. And, you know, right after those attacks, how united we all were. And today we're so divided. I mean, and, and the the bad thing is most of that division comes from our government itself that's become so corrupt you know they're they're dividing rich and poor and black and white and gay and straight and every every angle they can use to divide us they're doing it and i i don't know and we we, our our hopes in jesus and we got to keep that in mind because uh this world has, has got plenty of faults yeah i hope that uh I hope that all over the radio, I don't know if you remember that song that Alan Jackson wrote, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning? I don't know how much better of a depiction of today could have been through music is is what Alan wrote in that song. But uh, I think he actually sang it live for the first time while he was uh, at an award show or something several years later for the very same reason. You know, we've kind of lost focus on what it was, so... I've I know you visited downtown Manhattan uh, and I've been there to see that memorial. It's it's just it's it's very humbling to not only know how many people lost their lives, but what the 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 reason behind it was. So uh, just keep that in perspective. I think if we're being good parents and uh, and and teaching our kids what we need to be teaching them, I think it's a part of our history that we need to learn from and. I, I hope that the world finds focus in Christ and and moves forward in a positive manner, but it's sure not looking real good. No, you're, you're right, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. Well, I know what the answer is. We, yeah, for me, it's shut off TV, shut off the news, <laughs> and um, I, I learn more about what's going on each week at church than I <laughs> than I do watching the news because I don't watch the news. I, I don't watch TV, so. Yeah. Uh, we I, we I both tell you. we've both talked about how much money we've saved giving up the TV and that bill every month, but we don't we don't watch it. And there's no time, but we have yeah. a great show for everybody today. Um, uh, Bobby Worthington, who is probably one of my biggest whitetail idols ever, because I grew up reading this about these articles that this guy. I think I think you said that no one else has ever been featured more in North American whitetail than Bobby Worthington. I think that's an accurate statement as far as we know. Um, but what a true icon in the deer woods. And the most impressive thing about it is this guy isn't a guy who has a thousand acres in Iowa you know, with, with, with two buck tags every year in crazy managed property, this guy's getting it done in public land and big woods and mountains. 
and just killed some giants in all different types of terrain. And we have him on a little bit later on the show. Uh, it's going to be audio only. He doesn't have good um, internet in eastern ten- or Eastern Tennessee. So we'll put some pictures up for people watching on YouTube. But but before we get to that, let's dive in a little bit more to this fall shift that you've been talking about on social media. And last week on the podcast, you've moved cameras. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on with these bucks, why they're doing what they're doing, and then what we as hunters need to pay attention to. So there's going to be a lot of people listening that had a target buck that's disappeared. And then there's going to be some people who haven't had a picture of a buck all year that are hoping something shows up. So start with the trail camera side, and then let's talk a little bit about what these bucks are doing. Well, you know, it's a tradition of mine that, uh, um, late around Labor Day each year, I, I shift my cameras from those summer feeding areas, basically where I know there's bachelor groups of, of bucks and I'll start bringing those cameras to the, the fall ranges or the, the properties I have permission to hunt during hunting season. And so, so I can monitor the buck activity on those properties. And, um, the reason I do it so early is because when those bachelor groups break up, uh, it's not like, you know, one night, boom, there, there's 10 bucks in the bachelor group and the next night, boom, they're all gone to different places that that bachelor group slowly breaks up and just, one buck leaving and another buck leaving you know a few days later or a week later this transition takes place over several weeks and i want to have my cameras on those fall ranges before those bucks show up i want to know when he gets there to that to that property that i have permission to hunt it just helps me to you know when he gets older um and i decide to, to target a particular buck that's just one piece of information that's very valuable. And a, a perfect example is this buck behind me on the wall that, uh, you, you know, he did not show up on the property that I could hunt until about November 6th every year. And it would have done me no good whatsoever to hunt that buck in October there. Cause he wasn't there and having this trail camera history of when an individual buck makes the shift gives you a a real leg up when it comes time to hunt that deer that's uh so that's a i want to dive into a couple pieces of that the first one is whether you have a target buck or not right now uh starting to document and make notes of what those three and four year olds are doing right now is pivotal for years in the future you know it's really easy to lose sight if we have a shooter but I, I don't think hunters are paying a lot of attention to those younger bucks that maybe are a small 10 or maybe they got a little kicker or they have unique brows where we can track them for ye- from year to year. There's always something that, that tips us off about a buck from year to year. Uh, talk a little bit about the importance of not focusing as much on this year in your buck, but also the, the bucks coming up next year and the year after. Yeah, when when I I start watching different bucks at different ages, so I've actually and it's pretty rare, but there, there's been a couple of occasions where I've seen year and a half old bucks that were so impressive as year not not that they were huge, but they had Mel's a perfect example. He he was a ten point yearling, and there's no doubt anybody that's seen that deer that was a yearling buck, even though he had 10 points, that was a very, very small 10 point rack. Um, there was another, this buck right behind me is another perfect example. When that buck was a year and a half old, he had six points on each side of his rack. And those are the kind of bucks that, you know, have the potential to be really good when they get to be five, six years old. So I'll start trying to monitor those bucks at an earlier age. Typically I don't start, monitoring an individual buck until he's about a three-year-old and to be even more specific if he survives gun season as a three and a half year old that's when i really start paying attention and and i say all this and i need to throw out that a lot of bucks i want most bucks that i start watching i never get to hunt probably only about one in 20 or 25 bucks that i start watching do i actually get to hunt and kill 
because something happens to them along the way. They get killed by another hunter. They just disappear or whatever. So, right. you know, I'm tracking a lot of bucks that I never get to hunt. You know, we, we talk on this podcast all the time about intrusion and downwind side of bedding and different techniques for the hunting side. But, you know, for what you're doing at the level you're doing it, uh, for our guest we had on the podcast last week, you know, these guys like you that are trying to find the elite, the the far end of the bell curve, the, the world-class bucks, it's not just knowing them how to find them. It's about putting the pieces of the story together. And I just think we, we probably, as, as podcast hosts, don't do a good enough job of saying how important it is for your record keeping and for logging information of the younger bucks that you see uh, every year while you're focusing on the one you're going to shoot this year. It's just so easy to lose track of that and, and focus on just the short term versus the long term. Right. You know, just yesterday I, I checked some trail cameras and, and I found another year and a half old buck that, that I saved pictures of that deer just because he's got a lot of points. Um, the angle that I, the pictures I got from, him, I couldn't tell exactly how many points he's got, but he, uh, put it this way. He's got at least 12. Wow. And I mean, we're talking a little short times, you know, three or four inches in most cases, and some of them only two inches maybe but he had a lot of them. And those are the kind of bucks that if they can make it to five, six years old, they can be absolute world-class giants. Yeah. But you know, the odds of that buck making it are very slim, but it's got to start somewhere. Yeah. But it's it, the slim chances you're, you're, you're trying to find the needle in the haystack anyway with these world-class right. bucks. So you have to start there now, um, backing up another another point that i want to elaborate on a little bit you you're saying that these bachelor groups are breaking up and, and kind of dispersing a little bit but you want your cameras in front of that move the, i think what you're trying to say there and you can correct me if i'm wrong but the worst thing we want is for that dispersal to happen and then that buck be there and then we come in and bump him when we're trying to move trail cameras well, that that's a big part of it, Terry. But you know, I put those trail cameras out the first of July. Uh, that that's you know the two holidays, Fourth of July weekend, Labor Day weekend. I I first put them out there in early July, and, and by the time Labor Day rolls around, I, I've already got good pictures of every buck in in that bachelor group or that area. One more picture isn't going to make or break you in the, in the summer exactly. bachelor group. Exactly. That that's exactly right. So. I, I want to get in there and I want to get them ahead of that shift and get them moved. And then when the buck shows up, you know, good chance that my scent's already gone from being in there. Any disturbance I made has already happened and been forgotten about. And, uh, he's not even there to know there was a disturbance to be, to begin with. So, uh, you know, it's real critical that element of surprise with a mature buck. Um, you, you don't get to make the same mistake twice with a mature buck. Um, you get one chance to make a mistake and, and you, you don't, you don't do that again. Cause he, he's just not going to give you that second chance. Yeah. For my properties in Illinois, we did that two weeks ago and, uh, and are done there. I mean, those cameras are going to be in the same place now for the rest of the year. Kentucky is a little bit different because, you know, we're already hunting here. So, you know, some, some, if somebody had a trail camera picture of it, it might help them, you know, try to hunt them a little bit before the bachelor group broke up. But, you know, I'm sitting here getting ready to leave for Chicago. I'm not going to be even back to where I can hunt till probably September 18th or 19th. So, uh, I'm already looking for my plan for late September, early October to get it done before I come to Illinois. So I think everybody's kind of got to adjust their strategy based on the state and the area they're in. But, I think if you're going to shift cameras, you need to do it now and get it ahead of those. Cause I've already seen, there's been a couple big bucks killed in Kentucky. They're already hard horned. And you mentioned that you've already seen some bucks show up on cell cameras that you hadn't had pictures. So some of this has already started. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, uh, we talk about mature bucks being individuals and they have different tendencies as individuals. Um, when, when a mature buck or when any buck, when he shifts his range and you, you key in on that, you can count on him doing it at the same time next year. And I don't mean within a week. I mean, within about 24 hours. 
Right. So if he, if he leaves his bachelor group, say September 15th, well, next year, 14th, 15th or 16th, he sh he's leaving that bachelor group again and, and shifting to his fall range. Yeah. So if I'm in Kentucky and I start, I stop getting pictures of a buck on September 9th next year, I know I got to put a plan together to try to kill him before September 9th. When, if Absolutely. I'm hunting that bachelor group, if I'm on the other side of it and I haven't gotten a picture of a buck all summer, but then all of a sudden there's a shooter and I'm in Illinois and I get a picture on October 5th, I need to start putting a plan together to be able to hunt that two, two, three day window right there when that buck shows up to get my first crack at it. Right. And you know, something that we need to throw out here for the guys that have had a good buck on camera all summer and the buck has left. Um, we, we talk about the article that I wrote, um, several years ago called homecoming bucks. There, there's two, there's two windows of opportunity when you, you still might have a chance to kill that deer. And the first one is November 7th and you can mark it on the calendar. It's going to be the seventh or the eighth right in there, maybe the sixth, but within one day of November 7th, um, as the rut is starting to heat up. A lot of times I've got, I've got numerous examples on trail cameras that I show in a PowerPoint presentation uh, of bucks that, that return to their summer range from their fall range for a very brief period. And usually it's 24 hours or less. Sometimes it's just overnight. But uh, my theory is that these bucks have shifted to their fall range. The rut's starting to heat up and they are not able to find a hot doe. So what do they do? They get desperate and they run back to an area they're familiar with. They don't go into strange areas, just randomly searching. Um, they go back to an area they're very familiar with their summer range to look for a doe and, and they only are there for a very brief time and then back. And the other time they do the same thing at the tail end of the rut, they're around Thanksgiving weekend it is another time where some of those bucks will, will come back and, and not every buck does it. But uh, there is a there is a glimmer of hope if you had a giant on camera all summer and then boom he disappeared. The seventh and eighth, sixth, seventh and eighth, you need to be in a stand because if he is coming back, it's going to be one of them three days or Thanksgiving weekend or possibility really really late season if you're the only food in town. It's possible to bring go. him back. It's possible to bring him back in town if you've done habitat work and have food in town. So, so how many more cameras do you have to move uh, to to be ready for this fall shift? Are you halfway Ooh. done? A third of the way done? Almost done? Uh probably three quarters of the way done. And I, I believe that you have some habitat projects this weekend that are on the docket for other properties, maybe in Ohio. I don't know that you want to talk about that any or not, but I think that's on the docket. Still running a little bit later than what you wanted to because of the weather, but you're still going to try to put it in um, yep. and start documenting that, right? Yeah, I'll be headed to Ohio, the, the farm I got there, to plant a food plot and put some cameras up and I have no idea. We just, we bought the farm earlier this year and uh, I was so busy with consulting in the winter that I didn't even have a chance to go walk my own property. And which is one reason I'm slowing down folks. My, my own hunting success is, well, I shouldn't say it's going to suffer, but uh, it, it very well could if I kept up the, the work pace that I had been going. So uh, I'm going to get over to Ohio and, and uh, get some cameras out in that food plot planted. Yep. So, uh, I've been hunting one time season open the first Saturday in September and only been able to hunt once, uh, going to have to ride the pine until it gets back. I had, I've had four opportunities in the wrong weather, so it doesn't do any good to try it and end up boogering it up. So trying right. to stay a little bit patient and positive. Uh, he's still there. So, uh, we'll see, we'll see what happens. He was there. He he didn't leave last year. He he stayed on the on the property he batched their group at. So I bet uh, you get him. Yeah. If I don't, I don't. Um, I'm I'm not gonna stress about it. You know, we Bobby Worthington's gonna gonna get on here a little bit, and uh, we're gonna intentionally leave our comments a little shorter today because I want people to hear 
who this guy is. Uh, for those who've read his articles, to be able to hear it, this type of side of Bobby is amazing. And and he spends a lot of time focusing on why we hunt and for the right reasons. And it really puts into perspective for me. I mean, I have the same struggles and demons that everybody else does. Uh, my job is taking me away in the beginning of hunting season for you know, this long and I could be mad and upset about it, but you lose focus. You don't want to put that pressure on yourself. It's remember what we're doing this for. It's our hobby. It's our escape. And when we lose perspective about that, you start really making some bad decisions. And he even talks about that a little bit too. Right. Well, he's just a a first class gentleman and a lot of respect for him. Yeah. All right, so we're going to take a quick break and listen to uh, our friends from Osseo Gear and then come back with a segment with Bobby Worthington, uh, one of the Dream Team members. Osseo Gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched, pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations. Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit osseogear.com. That's A-S-I-O gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear, prepare to be invisible. Well, we're honored on the podcast tonight to welcome the the newest Dream Team member, Bobby Worthington from Tennessee, to the podcast to talk about the buck forecast. Don, we have Bobby on the line with us, and before I let him talk, you're going to tee it up a little bit and tell us how you know Bobby and why he's a Dream Team member. Well, you know, I first heard of Bobby Worthington back when I first started riding for North American Whitetail. Uh, Bobby started writing for him about the same time. And, uh, you know, I could just tell by reading his stuff that, that he, he was the real deal. He, he knew what he was talking about. And if there was any doubt whatsoever, he removed it with the bucks that he killed, um, in the preceding years. And, um, you know, I, I met Bobby a few years later, um, known him probably 20 years now or thereabouts. And, uh, I'll tell you, if I'm ever put on the spot to name who I think is the number one best whitetail bow hunter on the planet, I, I always say Bobby Worthington. And the reason for that, I mean, some of these listeners are, are younger guys I know, and maybe you haven't heard of Bobby before, but there is no one that I know of who have who has killed the caliber of bucks that Bobby has killed in the places where he's killed them. Now, sure, there's some guys in the Midwest that have racked up some, you know, pretty impressive walls, but Bobby's done it on public ground. He's done it on in Eastern Tennessee where he's at, and uh, places where you just don't find big bucks. And, and he's went in and, and killed some real giants. Um, I think he's probably the the last I heard. There was no other deer hunter on the planet that's been featured in North American whitetail more than Bobby or, or the bucks he shot have been featured. And I think, uh, well, at one point it was seven different bucks that he'd been shot. He had shot that were big enough to be featured in North American whitetail. And it might be more than that now, but, uh, you know, I, to describe Bobby, I, I would call him a Southern gentleman. He's, he's a soft spoken guy. His, his values are just unquestionable. A uh, Christian man that, that uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for. And, uh, you know, I'm anxious to hear from him. Well, Bobby, welcome to the show. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, before you talk, to be put in even the same flyer as Bobby Worthington was probably the biggest uh, um, insecurity I've ever had in my life. Because those of us who grew up reading North American Whitetail – even though we haven't met you in person, have looked up to you for years, and it's an honor to have you on the podcast and call you a colleague of the Dream Team. So welcome aboard. Well, thank you, fellas. I really appreciate that, and I really appreciate the kind words you said about me. Hopefully, when I'm done speaking, you won't have to spend too much time taking that stuff back. (laughs) (laughs) Well, 
Well, for those who for those people who don't know Bobby Worthington, not only if Don mentioned that you were have been a, a longtime writer for North American Whitetail, you've killed some giant bucks. Uh, for those people watching on YouTube, I'm going to flash some of those pictures up as we're talking here. But you've also written some books. So, how many books have you written? I've co-authored a few. One of them, Don, Don put out, and I've written two on my own, which is quite a chore for a guy who ain't got much education like me. But I, I suffered through them, and when you read them, you'll you'll see that I ain't exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's two of them, and they're no longer they're out of print. And yeah, kind of hard to come by them. If, if one of them sells, it's usually a pretty price, and I don't really understand it. I, I want to back up and say I, I, I've been following you guys and Don for a while. I, not much on listening to podcasts, but Don through his writing and I've got all the respect in the world for both of these and this Lester Speak program you got is just you, you guys are to be commended. Something like that is much more valuable and much more important than killing big bucks. You've your heart's in the right place, and anybody that listens to your podcast for just a little bit will, will realize that. And so, let's keep in mind that there's more important things in the world than, than killing big bucks. But I know the listeners that's what they want to do, and that's their chosen pastime, and that's great if you just keep it in perspective. And you guys certainly do. Well, Don and I have said since the beginning that if we can win someone to the Lord, that's the ultimate goal. If we can help a family or help somebody in need, that's the secondary goal. And if we can teach somebody a tidbit or two to make them more successful in the field, that's just a bonus. That's 100%. That's, that's, that's get, keeping your priorities in the right place. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about, I want to talk about some bucks here. And, uh, again, for the people who haven't followed your writing, you're from Tennessee – and I think, are you from West Tennessee, I believe? No, I'm from Southeastern Tennessee. Southeastern Tennessee, okay. So uh, where all have you hunted in your lifetime and killed these big bucks? Are they are they all in the Southeast? Do you travel still? I know you travel for archery competitions, but where all do you, have you hunted over the years? Well, I've hunted a lot of states uh, in the Midwest. I don't go south much because of the quality of deer I want to shoot, but I've killed about half of the deer that was featured in North American Whitetail Magazine. I've killed let's see, and I think five was on public ground, either in Tennessee or in Illinois. Okay. So, so um, in Illinois, what else? I traveled to Iowa a while, way back there before it become a draw to hunt on non residents. But I, I wasn't as familiar with big deer as I am now, and I wasn't as I wasn't successful back then. I wish I could have them trips back, you know. <laughs> I think Don and I both have said that. I wish we knew now what we did when we were younger, when the deer herd was a little bit better before EHD and before crossbows. If we knew what we knew now back then, it would be a different wall, wouldn't it, Don? No doubt about it. Yep, but that's all part of the process. We all start as green beginners, and we just—it takes years to to get really good at killing these big deer. So, what what's your style? I mean, Bobby, are you a uh, are you a risk taker in the woods? Are you a low impact, low intrusion guy? Kind of, kind of. Um, uh, st- slow but steady working your way in or one of these aggressive run and gun guys what what do you uh kind of categorize yourself as a deer hunter well there's kind of two stages i look at i look at my hunting as two stages one is the last week october to about the third or fourth of november that's when I hunt a particular buck. If I've got to kill a particular buck, that's when I want to focus on him. And then if I've not got a particular target, which I usually always do have, then I'd want to focus on a little later in November. And then is when I'd hunt my tight funnels. I'd get right into them. And if I'm hunting a particular buck, I want to get right on his, I want to get right on his corridor where he's 
where he's making the rubs and scrapes and the corridor he's running. I want to get right on the scrape or the, the rub line that shows the heaviest use because he might come through there different at times, but the one that shows the heaviest use is where he's intersecting most of the time. But I, I want to get right in there, fellas, and, and, and get them because I hunt big woods deer. Now, it's a total different concept. I know exactly how you guys hunt in the Midwest and, and, and set your food plots up and your sanctuaries and your food plots adjacent to them, and that's wonderful stuff. And you can kill a deer hunting in that way earlier in the year. But when you're hunting, because they, they're not far from the, where their sanctuaries, where they're bedding to the food plot, but when you're hunting these big woods deer, a lot of times you don't even know where he's bedded. And you cannot pussyfoot around with him. You've got to get in there and set up exactly where you need to be. Uh, it's, it's a different type of hunting when you're hunting a lot of public ground and you probably have no idea where the deer is bed and you've got to go on the sign only. And where you're hunting public private ground, like you guys set it up, it's a totally different type of hunting. And if I'm hunting a particular deer, I want to hunt him starting the 25th of October unless it turns warm but if it's seasonable or cooler than seasonal that's when i want to get after him i want to get after when it's close enough to the first doe to come in that he starts moving in daylight but not late enough that the does are in and he's just going here and there and hanging up with them so if i'm hunting a particular buck that's when i want to do it and and really that's what i do most of the time and i will hunt a funnel when i'm hunting a particular buck but it'll be a funnel that's in his core area that's on his travel corridor. So right. that's about basically how I go about it. And if I'm hunting a particular deer and I don't I don't care what deer comes through, if it's not him, I'm not shooting it because I just consider it luck if I do. Right. I just I want to get to know a hunt a particular deer. But that's that's pretty well how I go about it. Well Don, before we talk about what Bobby's seen specifically this year Let's let's dive in a little bit deeper to his hunting style and especially hunting that southeast region of big woods, a lot of topography, basically in the mountains. Why did you go after Bobby? And you know, because we get a lot of requests for for people down there to have consulting. What what was your thought process there? Well, he brings something different to the table than the rest of us. He. He's, uh, lives in a different type of area than we do. He, he's hunting these bucks in a different type of region. And, you know, Bobby's style fits really good through, uh, not just the Southeast, but you get up into the, oh, the hills of Southern Ohio and, and clear up the East Coast, really. You get into Pennsylvania, uh, New, New York. York. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you probably up even into like Maine and Vermont. Um, I just think uh, his style is just a perfect fit for landowners in those areas. Um, you know, if, if he comes and walks your property and he tells you the tree to get in, that's the tree to get in. And, uh, you, you know, he, he's not so much on setting up the food plots, although um, I have no doubt um, he can get that done as well. But, you know, we get some, or I get some, potential clients contacting me that I, I look at their aerial and it's really rough terrain. Um, it's almost all wooded and you know, I'm kind of, I mean, I think that over time I would get good at hunting that type of terrain, but I just don't have that much experience with it. And Bobby does. And, and he's a guy that first of all, I have no doubt that when he goes to a person's, um, home or their property that he's going to, he's going to be a gentleman. He's going to be well-mannered. He's going to represent me very well as well as himself. Um, he's got his priorities in order, but when it comes right down to it, he's the guy that's going to tell you where to kill that big buck and he's going to be right on the money. Yeah. We talk about food plot diversity and habitat diversity. And I think, I think what your goal here was, was, when you picked the five of us to, to handle this as a team, you wanted that diversity and what kind of skill sets and styles that each of us have. And they're all completely different. And Bobby just brings that Southeast uh, area 
uh, big woods, a lot of topography, mountainous. Um, that's just something that we don't have the experience and skill set. So I think it's a perfect fit to have a guy like Bobby on board to do it. Now, Bobby, where all are you scouting, running trail cameras or glassing this year? Is it just Tennessee or you got plans elsewhere this year? Well, I may hunt Ohio a little bit, but right now I'm, I'm running my cameras and, and scouting in some hills here in Tennessee that I've hunted in the past. All right, so in East Tennessee, I don't know uh, if there's ever been big EHD outbreaks there or anything. What is the buck crop this year compared to most years in the past? Um, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing, kind of some uh, some trends or ideas you have about what kind of caliber bucks are out there in your area. Well, I'll tell you, we've had a very unusual year. It was not very good for the farmers and the ones that grow garlands. There's not a lot of farming in this area. There's some down in the Susquatchie Valley. But we've had a dry spring, uh, extremely hot and dry spring, and then in about mid-June it cooled off and went to raining, and it, we've had some flash flood, and we've had rain, and we've had rain this week. And that was a unique situation. And I tell you, a lot of people got the idea and was talking that we're probably not going to have very good racks on the deer because it was so dry this spring when there was the racks were doing a lot of the growing. And I, I tell you, I, I've got a different take on it. And my trail cameras and some of the velvet bucks, I checked yesterday some of the velvet bucks that was killed in Tennessee that the pictures are on the Tennessee well side is, is back to what I'm thinking. I usually on a, on a year like this, I see big racks and I'll tell you why. The most stress our deer get is not like it is in the north and the northern Midwest. It's not in late winter. The biggest stress period on our deer is June, late June, and through July and early August because the rain usually stops and the vegetation dries up and their racks are pretty well stopped growing then. They'll quit putting on time left. But this year, in the spring, of course, it was dry. But in the spring, I don't really care how dry it is. There's going to be some lush vegetation growing and, and things shooting out of the drown weeds and browse. And there's going to be some crops coming up, too, if people's got food plots. They're going to get, in the spring, they're going to get what they need if it, if it rains just moderately like it did this spring or, or if it gets pretty dry. But then come mid-June and through July, that's normally when the racks are Trying to, the deer are trying to finish their racks off and finish that full time length to their potential. And if it's dry then, it just, we seem to have smaller racks. But it rains so much through June and July and early August and, and right on through to now <clears throat> that I'm, I'm seeing real nice racks. <clears throat> and my trail photos are, are matching that up. I'm not sh seeing short times. Of course, there's going to be short times on older bucks a lot of times and on deer that just don't have the genes for good times, but I can I can look at most of my trail camera photographs, and if I'm seeing 10, 11, 12 inch points on deer in Tennessee, then I know their racks have reached their full potential, and that's what I'm seeing. So, Don, I think I think what he's saying is is very similar to what we've even heard Doctor Strickland talk about, and we've talked about on the podcast. It's it's when is the the high stress point of that animal's life through the calendar year really take the most effect? And you know, up in Illinois or our friends that are listening up in maybe Wisconsin, Minnesota, you know, Michigan, it's always the real hard winter with no food. Um, what Bobby's saying here is, is that, you know, usually the winters aren't that bad. They're still brows and the, the stress point could be in peak velvet growing season and it being dry or excuse me, with it being wet, having plenty of food to eat that time of the year, they don't have the big soybean fields like we have in Illinois. Yeah. It sounds very similar to Texas. Right. Uh, I know the summer is the, the stressful period down in Texas and I didn't realize that it would, it would be the same in Tennessee. So, um, I, I even learned something on this podcast. 
So uh, overall, though, Bobby, you're seeing some good ones. I assume you have a shooter that you're going after. Don and I don't talk about specifically about bucks that we're going to target, but overall, uh, the weather and uh, all of this rain has kind of led you to believe it's going to be a pretty good year. And and I think did some of Tennessee already open in in archery season? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago they had a velvet hunt, and I got to thinking about uh, what y'all are going to ask me about the potential. And I already had in mind that that's what had happened through my trail cameras, that we had some good racks because of the rain. We got into high-stress time. That it wasn't stressful at all. The vegetation started growing again. And I then I got on TN website, and there were some really nice velvet bucks killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, better than most years. So right. I think... I think that I think the potential. I think there's going to be some for Tennessee now. Don't don't compare them to the Midwest. We're generally 15 to 20 inches smaller on a certain age group deer, but for Tennessee, I think that we're going to have some very nice bucks killed this year, as good as any year in the past. That, in my opinion, now. Well, all of our listener, all of our listeners are hearing you say 10 and 12 inch long tines, and I think all of them are getting a little excited about East Tennessee. <laughs> well, you know that's the mature buck. That, that ain't, that right. ain't the young buck, and a lot of them don't have mature. It's a shame, but a lot of people don't have their mature bucks here to hunt. But even though I'm saying this, you got to keep in mind that this is the general deer population. You know, a particular buck that we might be hunting, his rack may be smaller than expected because you never know what happens to a buck during his life. Is, you know, he may have a large infestation of parasites or he, he may get sick. And if, if a buck gets chased by coyotes or dogs during that time like June and July when they're really trying to put on a lot of time length, I think that stresses them out. So... There's things that happen in the deer woods that just really is out of our control to a large extent. So people may be listening to what I'm saying and have a deer that they're hunting and be looking at the trail pictures, and it may not have grown any from last year, or it may have went down some, and they say, well, that's not the case. But you got to understand, you don't know what happened in the year, in, in the last few months in that deer's life either. So you got to keep, keep that in mind. But... Well, I'm going to put that brings, I'm, 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 Go ahead. I'm sorry. That brings up another point. You know, we're trophy hunters, and and I don't make any excuse or apologies about it. I'm a trophy hunter, and I want to kill deer with large racks, but we don't need to lose sight of why we hunt either. Uh, you know, we're hunting for the enjoyment, for the fun of it, and I'm afraid that sometimes we get caught up into shooting a huge rack deer, and we lose sight of this. So... Even though we hunt hard and, and want to be successful in trophy hunting, it, it should be enjoyable and it should be fun. It's, re- it's recreation, really, and recreation is to recreate the mind and body and to get to relieve the stress of everyday life. And like Don, I know, and you too, Terry, you guys work hard and long, and you need, and you work all year just for that time to get in the woods. So I just think a lot of hunters put too much emphasis on the size of the rack if the rack is if you're on a big deer and his rack didn't grow much or don't reach its full potential i don't think we should i don't think we should let that bother us because if we hunt for the right reason which is the personal challenge instead of for bragging rights then it don't matter if his rack is the same as it was last year or not i couldn't agree more and and you know if we get too much into hunting for bragging rights, wanting to kill a buck bigger than somebody on the internet or the the biggest one we've killed, sometimes, fellas, that leads to cheating. We've all seen it. Some celebrities, uh, hunting celebrities, and from personal experience, people around us, they'll get so caught up in the, in the challenge or the competition of hunting. I don't think hunting should ever be a competition, but they get so caught up in the competition that they might, they might end up cheating and, and and it just, you know, they embarrass themselves and their family when they get caught. So I think if we're hunting for the challenge and, you know, if we're outwitting the deer instead of actually the rack size, even though we're trophy hunters and we want to see big racks. 
Well, Bobby, I got a question for you. Um, you know and, and if and if you uh, if you don't want this in the podcast, you can tell me to edit it out. But for the people listening, and if it made the podcast, you've you've agreed to answer it. All of my family, where I grew up hunting, was in the northern Shenandoah Valley up in northern Virginia. That's where my grandfather first got me hunting. And then, you know, hunting up in the mountains in West Virginia. And one of the things that I hear a lot of people say that Don and I can't relate to is big woods and acorns everywhere through the entire fall. And I'm going to put you on the spot here since you hunt just a ton of big woods is... It, what what do you do about areas that's just huge woods with the mash crop everywhere in every, every direction that you look? Talk a little bit about your strategy as it relates to food in big woods. That has, that has nothing to do with where I hunt. The only way I would pay attention to mash crop if if one area – maybe got enough rain in the right condition to pollinate and another area then if if i'm not seeing any mash if i'm not seeing any squirrels working for my tree stands and i'm not hearing any acorns fall then i'll accept that unless i hear from other hunters or while i'm scouting i find mash in another particular area maybe a half a county over or a county over if so i'll move over that direction because the deer will migrate to that to that mash because they've they not got the food blocks like we do in the Midwest. But that said, the people that are saying that, I think they don't really realize, they don't see the big picture. I'm not hunting does. I'm not wanting to see a lot of deer from a stand, and I'm not hunting young bucks. I don't hunt food. I'm not interested in food because these big wood pressure deer are not going to be, you're not going to kill them. on. It'd be very rare to kill them on food. I'm hunting their corridors where they start right in the late pre-rut when they start making their sign and advertising themselves and running their scrape and rub line or when they start traveling looking for that first doe and heat or they get between does. I'm hunting something that will force them through a certain area. I'm not I'm not concerned with the food. I don't care if there's acorns everywhere. Ain't no acorns. And the people that does, I think it's more or less, may not realize it, but they're just hunting the general deer population. They're not hunting mature bucks. And, and you got to hunt them totally different. But they'll travel. A mature buck will travel miles looking for a doe. And he's going to go anywhere he wants to go unless he's forced because of terrain feature to go in a certain spot. And that's where I'm going to be. Well, you can't see Don and I's face right now because we're not we're not on behind camera, but both of us are grinning because you know, we we didn't tee this up. It was just an honest question I asked you and your answer falls right in line with everything this podcast is about and that is when we're targeting mature bucks, they act different than every other animal in the woods including young bucks, does, fawns, and we have to hunt different if we're going to truly target a mature buck right don absolutely yep totally different species almost so your your answer to that question even though i kind of teed it up i didn't know where you were going to answer it falls right in line with everything we talk about on this podcast and what mature bucks do is different than every other whitetail in the woods so we have to be different and our approach has to be different uh, to target those, you just bring a different element hunting those big those big wooded um, big wood sections. Uh, you know, further south or further east. I think it's I think it's fantastic what you've been able to accomplish. Well, I appreciate that, and I'm not saying anything about the people that bring that up, but it they just hadn't matured in their hunting enough to be a true trophy hunter. They may be a trophy hunter, but they really once the light bulb comes on, just like you two guys, it's like any endeavor. Knowledge is the only thing that will make you better. And once you gain knowledge to a certain degree and the light bulb comes on, then you understand it. Uh, me and you guys understand trophy hunting. And a lot of people just had not got to that point. But when they do, they'll say, now, why was I worried about where the acorns were or where they <laughs> want or because acorns were everywhere? It has nothing to do with killing the material bug. 
All right. When, when I go in the woods, it's just it's pretty simple to me anymore. It's just it's just laid out. And I understand it. I don't need nobody to go with me and show me where to put a tree stand. Uh, and I went with a lot of people and told them that tree there, none other will work. Well, it's pretty fire open. I decided to get right over there, and sure enough, I've had this happen at least several times. The guys say, sure enough, Bobby, <laughs> if y'all had been in that tree, I'd have killed a monster this morning. But I, <laughs> I, you just, they just don't understand the big picture. But once they do, if they hunt long enough and hard enough, and they pay attention, me and you guys, you know, we've lived in the woods, and we notice everything, and, and we finally... It's like any endeavor. It's it's nothing special to be a great deer hunter. It's just like any other endeavor. But once you reach a, reach a certain point, then the knowledge, then you gain the knowledge, and then of course you got to develop that knowledge in the skill. Which in deer hunting, it flows in the deal, you know. So. Well, I think nothing. I think that you know part of the services of of a consultant is to shorten the kind of the learning curve for that and having you come to somebody's property if somebody's disciplined enough to listen it, that light bulb clicks a little bit faster you know I, I can't tell you how many years I've been hanging around Don now for I don't know what is it 17 18 years now Don and yeah, something like that. you know I mean even though I am nowhere even close to where he is in his hunting journey it's shaved so many years off of that off of that cycle for me um, somebody who's really wanting to understand big bucks in big woods. Um, I, th- I think you can bring another element to that. Um, that that's just, it's hard to find by watching a YouTube video or reading a book. So now I'm going to tell you here, Bobby, you know, you're no stranger to podcast. Your, your writing has been, you know, in hundreds of thousands of people's hands, but now you have, a phone on speakerphone now talking into it with probably about a hundred thousand people listening to it right now. What are you going to do with it? What do you want to talk about? I'm going to give you a minute. You can talk about anything you want. You can bring up politics, religion. You know, somebody said last week that Don voted for Biden. You got, you got a couple minutes. What do you want to throw out there for all these people to, to hear you and get to know you? Well, I'll tell you, I, a lot, of, a lot of you know I, I lost a child, and when I did, I, I started looking at things different. Thank, thank goodness I've done a lot of thought in raising kids and, and uh, wanting to change things much. But I want to I wanna say this. I see this in children all the time. I want, to, I, want, I want my audience to understand that your passion is not necessarily your child's passion. And I see it in other sports besides hunting. I see parents put so much pressure on their children to excel in something they enjoy, whether it be hunting or ball sports or anything else, that they absolutely make the child's life miserable. And I think a lot of times parents want to relive the excitement and success that they've had in a particular sport through their child. And I just want parents to remember this as they go through life and raising their child that that your passion is not necessarily their child's passion and I'm afraid a lot of times we're blinded of that because of our own desires and not realizing it's not our child's passion. They cannot change their passion. We don't pick our passion. Uh And if a particular sport is not, if hunting is not your child's passion, then there's nothing that child can do about it. And it don't matter what endeavor it is. I just think that people need to realize that. And I see it. I see it many times after a competition, and even during competition. If you go to ball games, you'll see the parents standing on the fence, and they'll be bad mouthing the referees. And <laughs> and I've had several friends that I've I've been around, and they'll they'll on the way home in front of the child, they'll bad mouth the coach, and they'll bad mouth the for not letting their kid play as much as they thought they ought to, and then they'll turn in on the child because they didn't think they performed as well as they should have. And really, they're just destroying that child's happiness during a time in life when they, they should be enjoying themselves. There's enough stress in life when we get grown to put stress on a kid when they're young. And we should just allow our kids to follow their own passion and enjoy themselves in whatever endeavor it is. 
it don't matter if it's not hunting and if it's not the ball the sport that we played in it don't matter we should just we should just back them up and and support them in whatever they want to do so I, you know i've got three wonderful boys and and I, I promise you, if you do, they're probably not going to all have the same passion that you did. And I just, I just want you to remember two things when it comes to hunting or any recreation endeavor that we engage in. Like I said a while ago, the goal is to enjoy ourselves. And to do this, we have to make the challenge personal and nothing, not bragging rights or not to beat someone else. And I also want people to realize that your passion is not necessarily your child's passion. And a lot of times a kid will, you'll never realize it's not their passion. They'll, they'll work hard because they want to please you and because you're pushing them in it. And they'll work hard in that endeavor and they're just not enjoying themselves and they'll never be good. And you may not understand why. Well, they just don't have the passion for it. So that's, that's about all I wanted to say on that. They are, they are truly looking for the approval or the, um, the acceptance of a, of a parent. And, uh, you know, as somebody who's coached sports for so long, uh, ultimately that's why I retired is because number one, I've always let them, I got kids that are athletes. I got kids that are musicians. It's whatever they wanted to do. I supported, but, uh, I love the kids, but the parents are flat out crazy. And that's why I retired this year. So, um, I, 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 I had a level of respect for you, Bobby, before this conversation, and that just took it up a notch. So, uh, what an honor to have you as a colleague of the Dream Team. And uh, Don, I don't know if you got anything else to say, but uh, powerful stuff of another guy that, when you surround yourself with people like Bobby, it makes you better, right? Well, I think we just heard exactly why I have so much respect for Bobby. You know, it, yeah, he, he's what I consider the best big buck hunter on the planet, but it's, uh, you know, basically his, his personality, um, his morals, his ethics, uh, how he views life is why I respect him more than anything. And, uh, we, we just got a small snippet of it there. Um, we've had multiple conversations over the years just like that. That brief one there, and uh, Bobby's the real deal. And one last thing I want to throw out: uh, if Bobby tells you to put your stand in a tree, don't second guess it, guys. <laughs> you put your stand in the tree. Bobby tells you to because uh, <laughs> if you don't, you're making a big mistake. We have a lot of people where we try to give advice to, and all they want to do is argue because in 1984, someone saw a buck out of that other tree over there, so that's where they need to be. So. <laughs> well, point out to tell, you know, we, we deal with all kinds of personalities, and and that's fine. We, you know, that, that that's fine if they think that and they believe that. But there'll be a lot of people that see the uh, the insight that, that we have that really realizes that because of our record and because of you guys are the big bucks you've killed, and that they'll realize that that they need to take our advice in the woods. You know, you're dealing with wild animals. They're, they've got individual personalities. I might kill a buck from a particular tree, and, and I may scout it and say, this is the best buck to hunt from. And I guarantee you, day in and day out, it will be. But you may sit there three days and see two big bucks in another place. But if you sit there for two years, you're going to kill more bucks on that tree. we got to play the percentage, Bill. we got to play the odds. Money ball, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's so, so don't get discouraged, you know, if, if things don't work out quite like you figured it would. It may not mean that you've done anything wrong. They may have been a hot doe come through before daylight 50 yards from that tree, and that buck's cruising through there. And smelling her, with, with, even without his nose on the ground, sometimes they'll pick up the air. You, you just don't know why in nature it's just an odd thing to try to predict what uh, individual material buck will do, but that's okay. That's why I hunt places that they have to go to. That's why I hunt a, a steep, say a say a ditch funnel. Say it's really steep, and they don't want to go down into a blind spot and up out of it. And there's several trails coming together and funneling around that ditch. Nine times out of ten, that buck's going to go just like the rest of the deer does. 
uh, a heavy trail in the woods don't don't necessarily mean anything, but a heavy trail in the woods that is heavy because the deer are forced to be on it means everything. So that, there's just a lot of perspective people don't understand until, like I said, they really understand that light bulb comes on in their head and they finally say, now I've got it. You know, and you'll know when you do. My men, Tom, Don, and Terry, we realize that when that happened and, and we've, we've improved on it and, and got better at what we know, we've tweaked things. But when you realize you understand it, then there's no question about it. Well, fantastic. I'm glad to hear that your buck forecast looks pretty positive down in your area. Um, I like the tie in the dialogue about um, the weather and the stress point of the deer. I think it's a, I think it's a topic that w- comes up a lot on our podcast when we start talking about nutrition and food that's available and understanding the herd, the herd health, the gut health, all of those things. So I, I think it's fantastic dialogue, and um, I'm glad that you got some whoppers to, sh- to chase this year. As far as the consulting venture that you started here with Higgins Outdoors, real quick before we sign off, uh, I guess um, you know each each person has kind of a skill set or something they want to kind of focus on, and a radius they want to go in. You're you're located in East Tennessee. How far will you go, and what are you looking for to help clients if they choose to use you as a consultant? Wow, well, it, it ain't. I routinely drive 10 or 12 hours. I drive all day to go to archery tournaments and been doing it for the last four or five years. So, you know, if somebody needs me and wants me and thinks, thinks that I can help them, I'd be, be willing to drive a, a full day, you know. And, and uh, my skill set, I understand. I've been around, I've hunted the Midwest a whole lot. A lot of my big deer were killed in the Midwest. I understand about the diversity of food plots and I understand about sanctuaries and I think I could do a good job laying them out too but I really think that when it comes to the big woods there's not as I'd, I've got a, I don't know about you guys I'm not listening to a whole lot of what you got going on not because I'm not interested in it it's just I'm pretty busy but I I think that if, if I was laying out a piece of property I'd want 50 to 75 percent of it in, in native what it is right now because that's where that deer grew up that's that's kind of that's the kind of topographical one the kind of forage that he's used to living in and running in we don't run him want to run him off manipulating too much but a lot of times in this rough country you don't have a option to make 70 or 80 percent of it food plots and and switch strikes and stuff anyway because it's the steep you just can't do that you would have a bad erosion problem mm-hmm. and, and so the flats that you can get in there and farm and till and add food plots would would be great because like you guys like you guys point out before year-round food is so important to the deer and and diversity so that's the two main things that you have to keep in mind but sure my skill is the big woods guys okay. you know and uh, well, if you're interested in getting Bobby to look at your property and then have a uh, Higgins certified plan sent to you, uh, Bobby, how do you want people to get in touch with you to start talking about uh, um, your uh, availability? What's the best way to get a hold of you? I, I'm not too much on this text and or email and stuff. I've got a phone and I can I can talk a little bit. Maybe they can understand me. Then just call my cell phone. I'm a pretty personable guy. It's the number is four two three six three seven nine seven five seven. All right. And evening's usually best. You know, I've I've got a lot of different activities I'm doing, so you know. But anytime, anytime they're available, would be fine too. And the other thing I think. I'm sorry, Don, what I was going to tell you is I think that all of us that are affiliated with this team of people, when we talk to somebody and we listen to what their property is, what their goals are, if somebody calls me and and they got a a big wood situation, the first thing I'm going to do is say, I'm not the right guy to talk to Bobby. And uh, I think I think people can be assured that we'll help navigate the people who call in to better align with 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 who's best to handle it, uh, depending on the situation, right, Don? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to also add that uh, everyone on the team, their contact info is on my website. So you don't, you can feel free to pick the, the consultant that you want to work with directly. You can call all of them and interview all of them and, and make your choice of, of who you want to hire. But uh, you can go right to my website and get Bobby's phone number and his email. So uh, if you didn't have a pen to write it down, just go to HigginsOutdoors.com and you'll find it there. Well, Bobby, no, I'll tell you, go ahead. I've got, I've, I've got one client that I've got lined up already. and I'm on the phone with them, texting them several times a day and talking to them quite often. We can lay out a property and I can show you or tell you what tree to kill the deer from. But there's a lot of other stuff you need to understand. There's trail stand, tra- trail camera interpretation. There's when you should do certain things and when you should not do them. And once someone hires me, and I'm sure you guys too, I'm available to guide them through the process. And even during hunting season, I, I want to know what they're seeing and from where. So it's not a one-time it's not a one-time deal. I don't want to get in there and lay out the property and show you what tree, and then you just turn you loose, and you lose the information that would be valuable for you to capitalize on what I've helped you learn and showed you. Right. So I just wanted to point that out. Well, I think I think one of the things that this does with having multiple people doing you know, certified Don plans is, is especially if they're contacting us now and say putting us our list and we start dialogue with them now as hunting season's going you know in some cases you know i'm not taking that many clients i'm only doing a handful but i'm working with those people even though i haven't stepped foot on their property and we're kind of talking about stuff they're seeing right now and and telling them what to watch for what i what i really want them focusing on as they're hunting this year and it makes this fall uh, excuse me this winter when we go visit the property so much more productive so all i can say is no matter who you're thinking about using and even if you're using a different consultant that's not even with higgins i i would go ahead and contact them now and see what they have to offer what their goals are how they work with you because i think that's going to be an important part of, of working with a consultant or somebody to partner with is, is having that going through hunting season this year before the plan gets put together when we walk the property in the fall, or excuse me, in the winter. That's right, and, and we expect we're dealing with people of integrity. We want, want them, somebody that's already hired another consultant firm besides Higgins, we want, want them to contact us and just lead us on and, and – us up every day trying to right. help them you know right we, we 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 believe that we're dealing with people of integrity so we're willing to help them any way we can once they show interest in in right. retaining us their property so right but until we get there the plan really can't the root plant can't be in, or uh, evaluated that's why uh you know doing topo stuff isn't our style and why don's never believed in that to begin with so Bobby, I appreciate well, you having us or spending the time with us tonight. Terry, I'm glad you said that because I've never been able to hunt a deer on the top of the graphical mouth either. I've got to put my feet on the ground. So that just <laughs> that falls in. I think we're all on the same page with that. Right. Hey, I appreciate Guys, I appreciate it. appreciate the, the good words you said about me now. You, you're too kind. And. And uh, I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity to, to work with y'all and to work with hunters across the country. Thank you a lot. Well, I told you before well, we started recording that if we said something we needed to edit out, I could do it in post-production. We wouldn't start over. But looking over this conversation we had, I can't think of one thing I'm going to take out. This is going to play as it aired. Yeah. Bobby, I can't tell you how excited I am to have person i consider the, the number one deer hunter in the world as part of the team and uh it's your integrity as much as your hunting skill so uh look forward to many more conversations and we'll have you back on at some point well i really appreciate it i i really do and if, if you want to take anything out you want to send me a bit you know i'm sometimes i get talking a little bit too much maybe not a problem at all with us so fine We're going to take a break and go to the buyfarm.com segment of the week and be back with some listener-submitted questions for Don to answer.
Well, Don, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We just heard that segment from, from Bobby and, um, you know, Mark Luster is one of the best hunters I'm, I've, I've ever heard of, you know, he's, he's gone out and found these deer. Um, but when you put even my name with, with Bobby Worthington, that, that was a humbling thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll never, uh, I'll never live up to those standards. I don't think as as a outdoorsman, but um, what we just heard is that man's going to be a a role model for a lot of people that get to connect with him through hopefully this podcast and the consulting business. He's a he's a man that uh, uh, very soft spoken, but with a lot to say. Yeah, you know, uh, Bobby is one of the authors in, in my book, Whitetail Icons, and he is truly an icon. Um, I, I just can't say enough good things about him, but, uh, back to your, your comment, Terry, I, I think that, you know, Bobby brings something totally unique to the, the group that none of us, none of the rest of us, uh, have his skill set. But at the same time, if you look at everybody in the group, each one of us has a little bit different skill set or, or experiences. So, uh, you know, when, when someone's looking for a, a consultant, I think uh, we've got so many options that we are going to have a good fit for every property, every client. And, uh, you know, Bobby just helps diversify that group. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm humbled to even be able to be considered a colleague of him. So a special guy, but very humble guy. This guy had a platform with over a hundred thousand people listening and what's he do? He encourages fathers to put parenting in the right perspective, not to self-promote himself, not to try to get people to use him as a consultant. He wanted to talk about his experiences as a father and give some advice to to people coming up and, and uh, raising their kids. So special guy. For sure. All right, well, let's move to the first question of the week. And we're going to keep this a little bit shorter with only three tonight. Uh, cause I'm trying contacts for the first time. I don't know if anybody can watch on YouTube can see how bright red my eyes are. They've been in for about 13 hours now. So I'm ready for bed and taking these contacts out. <laughs> well, you look like you just climbed out of bed. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this question comes from uh, Casey Larson from Downing, Wisconsin. Uh, Casey says, hello, Don and Terry. I have a couple of questions. Question one, Don, you've often said that people should be at least 40 years old before they get an article published. Do you think there should be a minimum age for whitetail consultants? <laughs> Question two, I think Casey's trying to pull my string here. Terry. <laughs> Question two, how far does constant human intrusion from a bad neighbor affect the next property over? And what percent of hunters do you believe are givers and what percent do you believe are takers? Oh boy, you talk about unique questions. We ain't heard these before, have we? I want to start uh, with number <laughs> one about the uh, 40 year olds. You know, I think that, uh, well, the, the sign of maturity of a person is admitting when they were wrong. And I, I made that statement that uh, I, if I was a magazine editor, I wouldn't publish an article from anyone under 40 years old. And I've been called out on that a couple of times, not just here on the podcast, but maybe in uh, private emails or social media messages or whatever. So I've had a chance to reflect on that. And, you know, I, I think I should take that statement back and, and correct that statement. Really. Um, if I was a magazine editor, uh, uh, the writer's age would not matter so much, but I, I would expect that writer to be able to validate whatever point he's trying to make in his article. And he should be able to validate that with, with dead bucks, dead mature bucks, because I mean, that's what most of these are, are magazines are geared towards. Um, although some of them are just general deer hunting, but so with that said, there are guys in their say mid to later twenties that I think could write a better article than some 60 year olds. 
Um, I, I know guys in their sixties and probably older than that, that they're still out there and, and they still are just, and, and maybe they're hunting for different reasons. Maybe they don't care at all about mature bucks, but, uh, they, they're doing the same thing they were 30 years ago and getting the same results. And, and then there's guys that are in their 20s, not, not so much their early 20s, but maybe their later 20s that have figured a few things out and, and they've dropped more big bucks or more mature bucks than, than some of these older hunters. So, you know, I think age should be taken out of the equation. Um, I was wrong when I said that. Um, believe I, I'll admit I was wrong, but I do think that if you're going to make a point, you need to be able to back up that point. And I used the example last week, um, there, I would seen a, a, a post about, um, hunting early season bucks and, and someone said, forget the October lull, forget the not hunting October mornings, forget this, forget that. Okay. If you're going to say such a statement, have the bucks to back it up. You, you say, go ahead and hunt October mornings, have some mature bucks that you've killed on October mornings to back up your statement. And if you can do that, if you can back up whatever point you're trying to make, it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, I, I think a, a guy that's say in his forties or fifties is going to have more years and more experience to be able to back up his point. But if you're 20 years old, if you're 15 years old and you can back up what you're saying with multiple I'm not talking get go out and get lucky one time. I'm talking if you can back it up with multiple mature bucks that you've killed using the tactic or whatever you're writing about, then age shouldn't matter. I think one thing this podcast has taught both of us, number one, a couple of things actually. People listen and remember every small detail of stuff that we say that we don't even remember talking about. And Number two, neither one of us are trained as public speakers or you know, my, da- <laughs> my, my, my dad's a, has a doctorate and, you know, he's a minister and has, has his doctorate and teaches homiletics, if that's even the right word, but basically the art of preaching, um, and all of that stuff. Neither one of us are trained in any way, shape or form. We, we kind of say it like it is. And sometimes, uh, it, what we are trying to say doesn't come out the right way and that's okay. I mean, we're, we're just normal people that make mistakes and we've had to apologize and say it wasn't right. But I think the consistent thing here is, is that if you're going to claim to have an idea about something, either cite the person you got the idea from, you know, like the rope scrape, for example, I've seen so many pictures all over social media of people that are using rope scrapes now. And it's a great thing. But there's also people claiming it's their idea, and and you're probably the one that made it famous by making videos and talking about it, but it wasn't even your idea, and you cite where the idea came from. So I think if if we do that, that that's a good practice for us. And then the second thing is, is when we say stuff, when, and I think that's what you meant by the 40-year-old, it's, it's show the experience to back it up. Um, if not, just say, Hey, this is a theory that I'm trying be, be transparent in it. I'm, you know, we don't want anybody to be discouraged about chasing their dreams and whether they want to get online and talk about something, but represent it properly, I guess is where my biggest problem in, in, in this whole thing is right now is if, if I have an idea or something, I don't get on there and say it's science by any means, unless I can prove it. But I think it's okay to say, hey, I got a theory and and talk about it. You know, we were talking about that EHD thing with the hurricanes. We have no scientific data to back that up. It's a theory. Uh, just mm-hmm. like uh, same time, same place you just talked about. It's a theory that you have that you've written articles about, not a science. So I think that's really a nutshell of what the, the comment was centered around with 40 years old. Because there's 30-year-olds right now that could be a whole lot better consultants than mid-50-year-olds that are out there that have shot more consistent big bucks and and know more about ground and farming and habitat and everything like that. So I hope that makes sense. We're by far not perfect, and we fumble on our tongue more than we probably articulate the right thing. But this podcast sure keeps us honest because we get corrected on stuff we don't even remember saying. Yeah. Well, I think that that 
comment might have been an underhanded uh, jab at West Delks, uh, being a consultant, you know, and being young. Um, that's what came to mind when I first read it. You know, I've got Wes working for me, and he's not 40, not even close to being 40. But here's the thing. I, I know guys in their 50s that are consultants, and if they went and put a tree stand up on a property and Wes Delks went and put a tree stand up on the same property, I'm going to sit in the one Wes put up. So yeah. and we can make assumptions on what Casey meant. And it's just an assumption. We don't know that that's what it meant or not, but let's move on to question number two about human intrusion from a neighbor, a bad effect on properties. What do you got to say about that one? Do you remember well, the I question it, or do I need to yeah. read it? No, I, I remember it. And it, it depends on how the properties lay out. I mean, if you've just got a woods with an imaginary property line through the middle, then definitely that neighbor's activities are going to count as human intrusion on yours as well. But, you know, if there's some kind of a physical break or feature that separates the two properties, whatever it may be, then if I, an extreme example would be a road. If he's on the other side of the road, who cares what he's doing? Um, if there's some kind of maybe an open field that separates your woods from his, well, that, that sure changes the game instead of an imaginary line through the woods. So I, I think it depends on the specific situation. And then he asked about what percentage of deer hunters are givers and takers. And, you know, I can't put a specific percentage on it, but in my experience, just from what I, I, I've seen in my experience in the deer woods, there are far more takers than there are givers. And it's not even close. I'm telling you what, and I don't have to look very far to see it either. There's deer, deer hunting has become almost ruthless with, with some people that they don't care. I mean, they'll sit in your tree stand when you're not there. They did no work whatsoever. They just, you know, walk through the woods. There's a tree stand. I'm going to sit in it. Or they'll sit property lines knowing that the guy across the fence has put his whole life, his you know, just his soul has gone into developing a property. Everything that that he does is about developing that property. And they've got no problem sitting in line and shooting deer as they cut across the line. And then they want they even go so far as they want to track them back onto the neighbor. And if, if the neighbor doesn't allow it, well, the neighbor's the bad guy. Well, without a doubt, before I get on too big of a rant, without a doubt, there are way, way, way more takers in my experience from what I've seen than there are givers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. I don't, I don't have anything to add. Hey, Spinks from Quiet Cat here in our virtual showroom space where you can connect with a product expert and learn all about our bikes, our accessories, and what makes Quiet Cat the leader in off-road electric bikes. Schedule a live session today by clicking in the link below or going to quietcat.com slash meet. Okay, this one comes from Zach Zimmerman from Kenton, Ohio. Uh, he says, Don, this question is for you. When you are searching for your next giant, how do you go about not stepping on people's toes when gaining new permission? I'm not saying I disagree with how you're going about finding bucks, but it would almost seem impossible where I'm from here in Ohio to be able to find a giant somewhere that people aren't already hunting. Plus, permission is almost impossible to come by anymore. I'm lucky enough to have two good farms to almost solely to myself. So I just stick with those and kill the best I got. Please don't take the question the wrong way. I'm not saying that you are encroaching on other hunters. I'm just cur curious how you're able to manage what you do with so many hunters in the woods these days. There's not much respect left in bow hunting anymore. Amen to that. Uh, 20 years ago, when I started hunting, there was a mutual respect between bow hunters to give each other space. Now they will put a tree stand right on top of yours. P.S. Are you starting to regret voting for President Biden? 
<laughs> just kidding. Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. God bless. Well, Zach, that's another great question that, uh, you, you know, when I'm searching for giant bucks, there's, there's probably not in most areas of the country, there's probably not a buck that's reached giant status, whatever that may be that people don't know about. And somebody is not hunting with trail cameras. So prevalent today, you know, just about every giant buck is known and someone is after that buck. Um, the bucks that I have on my home farm, they range off. People get their pictures. They are hunting those bucks. Well, that's, that's fine. So what I'm trying to do is when I find a target buck, I'm trying to figure out where that buck is staying, where, where he's bedding, where he's spending his daylight hours. And I promise you where he's spending his daylight hours is not where there's other hunters. Um, I, I have on multiple occasions, countless occasions, I've knocked on a door and got permission to hunt a property and was told something like, yeah, I've got two or three other guys hunting here, but you go ahead too. No, no, thanks. That, that's if you've got three guys hunting there, I don't want to be a part of it. I'm looking for a little secluded location to myself. So I'm doing everything I can to get away from other hunters and not step on people's toes. That's not to say that I never have, but I, I'll tell you this, I don't do it intentionally. And I also promise you this on a, a broad scale and average, if you will, I give other bow hunters way, way more respect than they give me. So, um, you know, I go out of my way to, to, to be the bow hunter that I want other bow hunters to be. And I may inadvertently step on somebody's toes, but I guarantee you, I do not personally do it. And I couldn't agree with you more on the fact that the, and I'm, I just had a conversation today with a taxidermist in Iowa and we, we were talking about this very same thing. And he, he got even more specific about the hunting industry, those in the industry and just how disgusting and dirty it's gotten to the point that he used to be in it and he got out of it and wants no part of it today um, because he, he's seen the inner workings of the hunting industry. And really the hunting community is, is not a whole lot better. Well, back to the point about, uh, where are we trying to hunt? We're trying to go where there isn't anyone else because that's where the buck's going to be. If there's already people there, most likely the buck's not going to be there. So right. it doesn't, it doesn't mean that these guys in big deer drives and stuff aren't going to bust him and push him and kill him. Uh, doesn't mean that he isn't going to chase a doe and run in front of one of these hunters. But for the most part, what we're trying to do and, and, and chase mature bucks that act different, just like Bobby Worthington talked about. You know, it's understanding how that buck is acting. Uh, you got to be where the other people aren't. And that might be something as, sm as small as uh, three or four trees out in the middle of nowhere. It okay. might be behind somebody's house or barn. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a great question and great perspective. But I think there's a lot of people like Zach that just don't have the ability to go out and branch off and get these other properties. And they just rely on the best they can make out of their property. And that's okay too. But when you're doing that, you're, you're basically subject to what's there that year. And when you're trying to kill world-class bucks, uh, you have to go out and find them and, 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 and go somewhere else. They're not going to be there every year. Just like, you know, if it was as simple as turning captive deer loose on your farm, you'd shoot a giant off your farm every year if it was that easy. You know, it's right. it's it's you have to go out and find these deer in different places. So I think it's a great question, but a lot of people are in Zach's boat where, you know, they're making the best out of managed properties, trying to do the best they can with with what they have permission to do. And that's OK, too. We can still learn and make the best decisions there. Um, then that's when discipline well, is even more important because once you have a goal, you don't want to deviate from that goal either. The one thing I do disagree with is that it's not possible in his area. My area gets hunted hard too. It's not like I live in some utopia where there's no hunting except for Don. Don's the only guy hunting here. It's not like that at all. I, I got to search. And I'm, I, I mean, if people had any idea how many hours I put in to find these deer, and then to try to gain access to some little pocket of cover 
that other deer hunters have somehow overlooked. Um, it's unbelievable. I can't speak to what Zach, I don't know his area, but I can, I know my area and I think it would be harder to find property in your area than it is in mine because this open ag co- country, you don't have much cover. So every little woodlot has a hunter in it. So right. I think, you know, when we're talking about Kentucky and some of Ohio, with big woods and a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, topography, those areas, I think are easier to find small little niche places that aren't hunted than it is out where you live because out where you live, there's just not many choices. It's all big right. open ag. Yep. That's a great point, Terry. So, all right, with that, we got one more question for the night. Okay. This one comes from Greg Schimbarger from Barry and center, Michigan. He says, dear Don and Terry, I hope all is well. I have a question about finding that next giant buck. I am currently sitting in the same boat as Don was last season. I killed the biggest buck on our property last season. And this year I have some older bucks to chase, but none are what would be considered world-class during these down years. What are your strategies to finding your next giant buck? Are you looking for a specific giant to hunt and then knocking on doors in this buck's area to get permission to hunt him? Or do you find properties that lay out great and then prepare and wait for a giant to show up? I really appreciate what both of you do for the hunting community and Lester's feet. Keep up the great work. Well, Greg, I do both of what you just mentioned. Um, I've got, uh, you know, my farm here in Illinois that uh, I managed to try to grow bigger deer. I've got a friend of mine owns a property a few miles away that uh, we look at on the master course. Um, that I've managed to try to grow bigger deer. I've got the Ohio property where I manage and try to grow bigger deer, but year in and year out, most of the bucks that I hunt are not on those farms. Um, and that was a mistake I made years ago and something I learned from. I was at a, uh, seminar in, uh, with Brownstown, Illinois with Adam Hayes, um, buck stop archery had an open house. And Adam Hayes and I were there as the featured speakers and him and I were together at, on the stage at one point and we talked about our, our various styles. And, you know, I was managing several different properties, trying to grow a big deer on those so that hopefully with all these different properties each year, I would have at least one giant on one of those to hunt and Adam had taken a totally different approach. He was going wherever he needed to go to find those bucks, even out of state. And, uh, it took me a little bit to realize, but his approach was definitely better than mine. Um, but I'm still doing, I'm doing both. I'm still doing my original approach, but I've, I've implemented some of Adam's tactics and and I'll go wherever they, I, I find those big bucks. And then I'm, once I find them, I'm trying to, it's like the Joey buck, you know, I hadn't hunted the area where he was at in, you know, 30 years. But once my friend Joe Johnson found those sheds and I got on uh, Google earth and I started looking in uh, the area over, I was, I was not looking for the best deer cover in the area. What I was trying to find was little out of the way pockets that I thought other deer hunters might have ignored. And I found two of those. I put cameras in both of them and boom, I get the buck's picture in both of them. And and that's, that's probably in a nutshell, the tactic that I use is I I find a lot of times I just hear about a buck and I don't even know if the buck truly exists or if he's really as big as what I was told. I'll go into the area and and think about where would that buck, if I was that buck, where would I hide to stay away from people? And then I get permission to put cameras there and I may or may not get his picture, but, uh, it's through those trail cameras that I'm really finding them and by placing those trail cameras in places where I don't expect other hunting pressure. And hopefully finding a picture of that 12 point yearling that you can watch for years to come as you're navigating all that, you know, that's like what we just talked about at the beginning of the show while you're doing all this stuff, chasing them, you, you document and find the up and comers and then follow them as you're going to. Right. Well, I got one more thing that I haven't told you I was going to ask you, and we only have three questions tonight, so this is the perfect time for me to tee this up 
and let you make a big rant to end the podcast <laughs> on. But it's important to both of us. We've both harped on this. We've both said how important this is to us, how disgusted we get when people don't take the extra care. But we're getting ready to go into hunting season for most of the country while some of us is in. Please just give hunters a little bit of a plea and some insight on being respectful to your trophy pictures when you when you do harvest an animal. And I, I I don't really mean for this to be a rant, but this is more us trying to be a little bit of an example. And while some people say it's not a big deal, uh, I think we need to make it a big deal. Yeah, I, you know, there's probably nothing disgusts me more than, than some of the photos I see um, on social media, especially now that uh, it's become so common in all, everyone's life is. Um, if you're going to take a picture of your deer, that, that's fantastic. I, I, I'm not saying that you need to go get a professional t- photographer to come out with, you know, lights and, and the whole works and, and have a professional photo shoot. Although those are, you, you can tell when someone has taken the time to take a high class, high quality photo, but you know, if you just clean up that deer, we don't need to see the bloody gory mess. We don't need to see his tongue hanging out. We don't need to see him in the back of your truck with a bunch of empty beer cans laying back there. Um, you, you represent this sport. That picture you take represents bow hunting or deer hunting. And as an ambassador, we're all ambassadors. Every last one of us. It doesn't matter if it's your first year deer hunting. You are an ambassador for this sport. And that photo represents not only you and your deer. It represents the sport of deer hunting to a lot of non deer hunters that see it. So do us all a favor, um, take a little time, clean that deer up, stick his tongue back in his mouth or cut it off. Uh, take some paper towels and wipe that blood away. And, uh, don't sit, throw him in the back of your truck and then sit on him. Like you just conquered something. Um, take a tasteful photo and, uh, you'll be representing the sport a whole lot better than if you did likewise. I guess for me, it's also about a level of respect. We put so much time, effort, money into chasing these deer. Um, I don't want to minimize, you know, we're, we're taking a life with this sport and we have to honor that life. And yeah, it's a celebration. We, we, we rally behind our buddies when they, when they're able to harvest deer and high five and hug and everything like that. But when it comes down to the memory that we're making, whether it's a doe, a spike, or a booner, um, being respectful with that animal as part of God's creation and 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 taking care of it is is just as important to me as it is anything else. And uh, it's like the you know people will get on on social media and and talk about oh I have history or what. Well, that's the final chapter of the history. You know, you're you're closing the story of everything you've put so much work into make it be classy, make it be, um, you know, and I mean, we go to the extent I go to the taxidermist and get an extra set of eyes and keep them in a Ziploc bag with my license. And you know, just something as simple as cleaning it up and putting the eyes in over top. So they're not glazed over is really, really important to me. And it's, it's just an extra step that I do to give honor and respect to the animal that I spend so much time, money, and uh an effort into chasing and um like i said there's going to be a lot of people that listen to this and laugh and say it's not that big a deal who cares uh it's a big deal to us and uh it's the respect that we have for this sport and passing it on to the next generation amen well said all right well i'm headed to chicago i'm going to take these contacts out get to sleep and head up north to the land of the liberals and hope I don't get mugged walking around downtown Chicago for about nine days. Well, I didn't tell you. I've, it's a good thing we recorded early because Sunday I've got to drive to Ohio for a meeting Monday morning for Real World. Um, so, so I I wouldn't have been I'd have been in a motel room Sunday night as well. Um, hopefully Dwayne Hopkins is going to be going with me if he can break free, and uh, you know we'll be back on our regular schedule here what in two weeks. 
Yeah. So, uh, so uh, on the 18th, I believe it's uh, the 18th. We'll be posting a little bit later in the evening as I'll be coming back from Chicago and we'll be recording. So, um, another thing is if when you do shoot something this year and you take your tasteful pictures of us tag don and i uh we want to be you guys are part of us in this podcast we want to celebrate with you when you do get something so uh tag us or hashtag it chasing giants and then let us celebrate with you we we want to see your success whether we whether we were help or hurtful in in your journey uh, we don't care. We just want to celebrate those of you who are enjoying the sport and having a good time. So make sure you tag us in that. With that, thanks for your support. We'll see you next week. God bless, everyone. Have a great week. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, Via Farm Real Estate Company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stand, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.